so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through free live interactive broadcast. And we have been going crazy these last two months. I think by the end of October, it will be 120 live broadcasts since September 13th. So Joe and I just, we don't sleep anymore. It's a good time all around. Now, today marks our second, or the, this program marks our second of nine exciting programs in a very new series that we've got going on all week long, the kickoff of the Ingenious Plus campaign. So what I'm going to do is play a little video highlighting what it's all about, turn it over to Jill Clark from the Rideau Hall Foundation, our partner for this campaign, and then we will dive in with our very exciting speaker today. So without further ado, let me bring that up and blow your mind. <laughs> You guys already had two really upbeat, exciting uh, ditties to go to begin with. Uh, I'm going to bring up the Ingenious Plus site on the bottom of the broadcast here, and I'm going to bring in Jill Clark from the Rideau Hall Foundation, who can explain a little bit more about what the video is talking about there before we dive into our speaker. Jill, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Jesse. Thank you so much for having us. We are so excited today. Uh, today, we are launching Ingenious Plus, which is giving young Canadians aged 14 to 18, the chance to innovate, uh, whether it's a product, a service, or a process, um, and win cash prizes up to $10,000. So we're so excited about this today. And if you're passionate about generating solutions to community, to our country, and to global challenges, Ingenious Plus is giving you that chance to innovate for good and make our world healthier, smarter, and kinder. So innovation, what is that? It's really just about doing something better, doing something to make an impact. So it includes improving on a product, improving on a service or a process, or creating something completely new that solves a problem or makes the world a better place, whatever that means to you. And, you know, often we think that innovation is technical, scientific, mathematical, and that's true. It, it is. But it's also social and community and health and solidarity. So you don't have to be a genius in engineering. Uh, you just have to want to improve the world around you. And this award invites you to present your innovation ideas. This is your chance to showcase your innovation to truly an exceptional network of Canada's most successful innovators. You'll have a chance to get entry into that network and also the chance to win some cash. So uh, tell us what you hope to solve or improve in your community and beyond. And you can receive cash awards and mentorships from leading Canadian innovators. Uh, we are accepting um, submissions. Uh, we have a deadline coming up in February. You can go to our website, which is ingeniousplus.ca for more information. And we really look forward to ushering in the newest generation of Canadian innovators. So with that, I will usher in Jesse, who will usher in one of today's best Canadian innovators. So Jesse, over to you. Thank you so, so much. Ushering is always a lot of fun. Uh, again, I've left at the Ingenious Plus site on the bottom of the screen. It's an amazing campaign. Honestly, Jill and I, when we grew up in school, you had to walk uphill both ways in the snow, even in summer. And so the opportunities available to youth now across Canada are amazing. I really hope everyone gets the chance to check out that website and get involved in the months to come, whether through these broadcasts or applying, putting in innovations of their own, a lot of exciting opportunities down the road. Now, Jill mentioned one of the key things that you can do as an innovator is work to make the world a better place. 
and no one embodies that more over our series of programs than Kyla Judge joining us today. She is the coordinator for the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe Youth, and she is going to tell us today a little bit about the amazing work that they're doing to foster a, a culture of land-based education, do some really amazing things, connecting Indigenous youth back to their roots and to communities galore. So Kyla, thank you so much for joining us today, and take us away. Awesome, miigwech. Yes, uh, I am so excited. I'm really, uh, really grateful for this opportunity to share about the work we've done as the Georgian Bay National Big Youth. So uh, a little bit about myself is that uh, I'm going to introduce myself in Nishinaabe Moen in the Ojibwe language first. So Ani Bojo is Yashko Wabuno Kwe and Dishna Kaz, Minwa Kaila Nido, Jagana Shi Nozwin, Wabja Shi and Dodem, Shawanaga and Donjaba, and Nishinaabe Kwe and Dao, Nishina Shinanan and Don and Saba Bongus, Georgian Bay Nishinaabe Youth, Minwa Georgian Bay Biosphere and Donja and Oki. So that is a lot, but what I have just said, I will translate. So um, my Anishinaabe name is Joshko Wabunokwe, which loosely translates to Blue Dawn. My English name is Kyla. I am from Shawanaga First Nation. I identify as Anishinaabe Kwe using she and her pronouns. I am 24 years old and uh, I uh, work with the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe Youth. And part of my role with the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe Youth is that I am one of the original four founders for our program. And so um, a little bit about GBA, uh, that's oh, the... Wow. Um, Kai, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just, it looked like you were switching slides there and slides aren't currently up with us right now. So if you are sharing the presentation, I wanted to make sure we got a chance to see those images. Yes. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> I've always loved, we've had uh, Anishinaabeg speakers on uh, numerous times in the broadcast, and it's such a beautiful language. I always love starting with Miigwech. It's just, I really think, you know, a lot of our classes will be familiar with land acknowledgements now, which is something that simply did not exist even five years ago. And so to know that, you know, in Toronto, in Mississauga, I'm on the land of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Mississauga is the new credit, is really important to me. And I think um, you can attest to this. Nativeland.ca is a, a platform that a lot of our speakers in the past have highlighted as a great way of learning uh, whose territory you are on across uh, what we now call Canada. So I encourage people to check that out and I'll, I'll share that in a bit as well. Kyla, is the backdrop, is it coming up for you or is it giving you trouble? <laughs> uh, I have it up, but it's not showing come, here. Hold so on. come back up to StreamYard with us One second. and Sorry. take your time, no hurry. <laughs> um, the perils of video, something has to go wrong in every video broadcast, otherwise it's no fun. Everything, right? Yeah. Like, it's a must. It's almost like a rite of passage. <laughs> yes. Now there should be a cat also jump on someone's head. It didn't happen to Jill. I don't have a cat, so we'll find out about you. Uh, but there we go. So I've got it up. And when you've got full screen with that, I'll pull it up for everybody. Perfect. Beautiful. You're all good to go. If you want to share any of your past slides, you're welcome to do that too. <laughs> oh, we much for that. I apologize for the for that. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is just a picture of me that I thought was super uh, relevant to share, um, and you'll see why very soon. Um, yeah, so as I said, I am one of the uh, original four founders of the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe Youth, and this photo here is of the four of us. And a little bit about sort of the background behind the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe Youth was that um, the four of us came together and we had this idea, we had uh, this purpose, this need to want to create a program. And for us, uh, it all started by sending each other a quick text and meeting at the local Starbucks in Perry Sound. And one of the, the driving factors for creating our group and, and developing our program was that we've always, always heard growing up that the youth are our future. And at that time, all of us were, I think most of we were under the ages of about 20 at this point in our lives, and uh, we all decided that we've grown up hearing that the youth are our future, and we're here now. We're asking. We're asking for support. We're asking for direction. We're asking for mentorship. And for us, it was hard. Uh, we we didn't always have uh, those people to or those organizations that would support um the needs that we were trying to address. And so uh, we took it upon ourselves and we decided, all right, you know what? We have four of us. Uh, we're a group We're we can start a collective, we can start a program and we did it, we ran with it. 
So with that, we started to create, um, at that time, we had no idea. We were literally creating an indigenous youth led organization. And there were so many different uh, learning experiences, learning opportunities, some really, really powerful changes in communities and the youth that we work with. So when we started to create our, our group, the Georgian Bay Anishinaabeg Youth, we really were focused on ensuring that we continue to stay Indigenous youth led for Indigenous youth. And so understanding that we have shared experiences and shared realities with those that we work with, other young people, uh, is, is a huge priority for program development and delivery. Because we are an indig Indigenous youth led uh, organization that uh, having shared realities, shared lived experiences is essential to ensuring that we are creating safe spaces, but also ensuring that we are um, inclusive and as accessible as possible. But that's also uh, sort of, uh, I want to say, like a key component to ensuring that our organization is sustainable and that uh, as young people, we are navigating systemic barriers. We are navigating colonization. We are navigating what it means to be a young Indigenous person in 2021 uh, alongside the youth that we work with. And so those shared realities and shared experiences uh, are are quite foundational to uh, program de developments and program delivery. And so uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about some of these photos here because these photos are uh, throughout the last three years that we've been uh, sort of as an organization. So the photo on the left is when we had uh, an opportunity to paint a mural at um, the Shwanaga First Nation Healing Center with Isaac Murdoch. The photo in the middle is from uh, the 2018 Perry Sound High School's annual student-led powwow. And if you look closely, you can kind of see that there is an individual holding the pride flag for grand entry. And if you've ever been to a powwow, or if you don't, uh, if you have not yet, uh, grand entry is um, is the grand entry, the beginning of the powwow. And for the first time in, um, I want to probably, I want to say probably the first time in the history of Perry Sound High School that the pride flag um, was brought in amongst the community flags uh, for grand entry, which is a huge milestone, a huge celebration for Anishinaabeg, uh, for the students at the high school to see that there is this celebration of identity. And then the photo on the right is uh, when we had the opportunity to visit the Shawanaga um, sugar bush in 20, 2018, 2018, 2019, sorry. And uh, we were out there and uh, we were visiting with my grandpa and my grandpa is the man with the bright red sweater. And so this was a really unique opportunity that we were able to go and visit and learn in the sugar bush from community members, elders and knowledge holders. And so uh, a little bit more of a background information piece on the Georgia Bay Anishinaabeg youth was that we were created uh, in 2018. So I remember it was a December, it was cold, and we were texting each other trying to figure out, okay, how can we uh, create this program? Like we knew that we wanted to do something and how we were going to get there was to be determined. And so um, yeah, after after we had met at that one that one afternoon in the Starbucks here in Perry Sound, uh, we had decided that we wanted to create this program, and we were so stuck on trying to figure out a name that we uh, it, it kind of deterred us from figuring out um, sort of like our, our goals and uh, how we were going to get there. So developing the program, developing our organizational processes, and what that could look like. Um, but uh, we were able to figure it out. And with that in mind, uh, the reason why we came together as a group, why we decided that there was this need to create um, space for Indigenous youth to, to gather and to organize was that uh, you know, we came together out of, out of the love that we have for our home our homelands, the places that we live, we came together out of the love that we have for the land and for the water. As Anishinaabeg people, we have this very deep and inherent connection to, to the places that we, that we live. 
And so for us, it was always about Georgian Bay. It was always about the coast. It was always about the land. It was always about the water. And so we wanted to really try to figure out how can we share our passions and the things that we love about this place we, we call home, this place that we share with those around us. And so with that, uh, we started to create what we now call ourselves as the Georgian Bay Anishinaabeg Youth. Uh, we are an Indigenous youth-led grassroots initiative with the Georgian Bay uh, Menadogamy Biosphere. And so uh, GBay works to support Indigenous youth through capacity building, mentorship of Anishinaabeg Odzawin, which is cultural land-based learning. So we support Indigenous youth ages 13 to 29, and the main focus of our work is to support is to support Indigenous youth by creating safe spaces to build strong community and cultural connections. And so this photo that you see on, on the top of the screen here is from uh, our Birchbark Canoe Build. This was the uh, culminating final sort of event, the, the last day of the canoe build where we were able to paddle uh, our Wigwash Jimon, our Birchbark Canoe. And so uh, I'll come back to the Bridge Park Canoe in a little bit, but just to share, just to share uh, some bits and pieces about how we operate is that um, as we are an Indigenous youth-led grassroots initiative, uh, we rely on grants and charitable donations to continue our work. And so our partnership with the Georgian Bay Biosphere allows us to apply for funding and, and ensures that uh, we administer our funds appropriately and uh, ensuring that as an organization that we are supported adequately as well and that we continue this process of mentorship. And then with that, uh, we have this amazing, amazing team of volunteers uh, that support the development and delivery of our work. So we have um, uh, what we call uh, an advisory circle. So we have uh, Indigenous youth who are part of this advisory circle that guide our work as the Georgian Bay Anishinaabeg youth. And then we also have this separate entity uh, called the Cultural Advisory Circle where knowledge holders, elders, and local community members will come and support, um, support our work. And then one of the the newest most exciting parts of uh sort of our work is that we are in the midst of piloting and developing uh, a social enterprise and it's quite the adventure i will say for sure but it's very exciting and so that means that we are doing um we are in the process of creating a fee for service type of program which then in turn sustains uh, our program, our work, and ensuring that Indigenous youth are still um, connecting with each other and the land. And then, of course, we could not do this work at all without the support of community. We have several different community organizations, whether it be in the Perry Sound community or area First Nations, that support our work, whether it's uh, shared program opportunities or shared um, uh, sharing spaces, what have you, we, our work is made possible uh, by the support of community. And just a, a little bit about our social enterprise and our fee for service that we are starting to figure out is that with the skills and, and the capacity building and the training opportunities that we've provided uh, to the members of uh, our advisory circle is that uh, we are figuring out how to begin and pilot our interpretive guiding. So uh, with the, the training opportunities of um, the online facilitation, uh, certified interpretive guides, but also having our certifications for sea kayaking in that uh, each, each of us have received um, these, train these training opportunities and certifications, uh, we, we can do this. And so this... Um, this piece of our learning and our development as a program program as an organization is huge it's reminding indigenous youth that the knowledge that you carry your ancestral knowledge your connections to your home or to the water to the land are valuable and they are employable workforce skills and by way of ensuring that uh, indigenous youth receive this training um, we're ensuring that they can continue this work however they see fit 
So whether it be interpretive guiding, like we, we've led some interpretive hikes, or we've done some uh, day trips uh, on sea kayaks on Georgian Bay, there's a lot that we're learning and it's super exciting. Like who doesn't wanna be out paddling on Georgian Bay for a day of work? It's quite beautiful. And then the other, the other piece of that is that we are trying to figure out how to share the knowledge and the gifts that Ushkinigig, our Wigwashjimon, our birch bark canoe has shared with us. And so that's also a pilot project. And I'm very excited to share more about Ushkinigig as well. Hi, my name is The Reconciler. My English name is Taylor. I'm a Martin clan from Shawanaga First Nation. I work for the Discovery Program at Kilburn Provincial Park, and today we're going to talk about the Wigwash Shimon, so the birch bark canoe, and this is my friend, Ali Bojo. Ali Bojo, I'm from the English Nikaz, and I'm from the Kailan, 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 and I'm Hi, my name is Kyla. Um, I'm a member of the American Plan. I'm from Shawanaga First Nation. I identify as an Anishinaabe Quick, and I work with the Georgian Bay Biosphere and the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe. Which can be is made of natural materials that have been harvested by participants through the Great Lakes. The hull is with wasp, which is birch bark. The ribs are made from cedar, which is gijik. The forts are made from the white ash tree, which is agimak. The outside uh, spruce root lashings and the spruce pitch come from the Gawanda Watig, which is the white spruce tree. The Wiglash Jimon, birch bark canoe, is deeply rooted within Anishinaabeg identity and culture. It connects people to the water, to the land, and to each other. The Jimon Kay Canoe Build is a great effort bringing together families and community members of all ages and skills. Building a Jimon is one of the most complex forms of Anishinaabeg science and technology. The Jimon K took place at Sail Perry Sound in October 2019. The Jimon K was led by a team of Indigenous youth known as the Georgian Bay Anishinaabeg Youth. They were guided by the expertise of a team of Anishinaabeg canoe builders from various places throughout the Great Lakes. With community support and the dedication of 40 plus high school students, the Jimon was built in 19 intensive and beautiful days. The Jimon is named Oshkinagig. The building of Oshkinagig was a vision shared by youth, elders, and adults alike to revitalize the Wigwash Jimon as part of Anishinaabe Otsuwe. The skills gained by participants are specific to the cultural identity of Anishinaabe communities throughout the Great Lakes. Following Anishinaabe protocols, sustainable harvesting practices were used to build Oshkinagig. Protecting the land and water for future generations is the pillar of Anishinaabe philosophy. So that uh, is this beautiful video that uh, our wonderful community partner, Kilda Provincial Park, has created to share about Oshkinigig, um, our, our birch bark canoe. And so this is just one tiny little short glimpse at the work that we do as the Georgian Bay Anishinaabe youth. Creating safe spaces for Indigenous youth to build strong community and cultural connections is very unique and specific to the individual. And for our team, uh, building a birch bark canoe using ancestral Nishinaabeg practices and protocols uh, was something that we all agreed, uh, all agreed upon to pursue. And so this, uh, this video is, like I had said, it's, it's just a glimpse into some of the work that we have done uh, together as GBA. And so um, this video right here, I personally love it. Uh, it, this is um, most of our team from uh, the build of Ochkene Gig in 2019. And so uh, I, I just really, I, I love it so much just looking at it. It's quite distracting. <laughs> uh, but our impact on community over these last three years has been quite profound in that uh, every single youth participant who has been involved in our programming supported our programming um, or been a participant within our programs uh, 
Each individual has said that they have felt our programs are culturally safe, culturally appropriate, but also safe spaces for them to connect. Uh, as young people, as young Indigenous people, it's also important that we have these shared spaces to just really be ourselves. It, and for uh, the young people we work we work with, it's often a common phrase that they refer to this experience as being like a breath of fresh air where they can just be Anishinaabe. And now I just kind of want to wrap it all up and in reminding each person here that is listening that investing in youth-led innovation is necessary for our futures, that yeah, young people are the drivers of, of the world that we live in and our capacities, our knowledge and our passion are so strong and they are so beautiful. And I'm excited to see uh, what else uh, others have to share today. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech to you too, Kyla. That is a beautiful presentation. If you want to come out of screen share so we can see you again and have a bit of a conversation, that would be lovely. I'll give you a second to do that. But what a beautiful birch bark canoe too. Oh, just gorgeous. I, I want to ask our classes when we get to the Q&A section, how many of you have ever had the chance to be in a canoe? It is, there's no other there's no better way to enjoy the water. Uh, and Kylie, you were mentioning, again, your presentation was so rooted in this amazing spot in the world. And I really encourage all our students, uh, gbbr.ca, the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. What a special place, not just in Canada, not just in Ontario, but the entire world. I mean, we've had several programs featuring this landscape. And if you've ever had the chance to visit, it is just mind-blowingly beautiful. So important culturally, aesthetically, uh, biodiversity-wise. I mean, it's just a, a really special place. Oh, so let's dive in. I want to, you know, you talked about youth-led uh, innovation and education, how important that is. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the health environmental leaders joining us at Westminster Pond, uh, one of our favorite classrooms we ever have on the broadcast. So welcome in Ms. Tran Pleasures Group in London. If you have a question for Kyla, come on in and take us over. Oh, yeah, come on in. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> so hey. Introduce yourself. My name is Brody uh, wondering what was the hardest part of building the canoe? Yeah. The first part in the canoe build, oh my gosh. Um, wow, <laughs> but there's just so many really good memories that, that are coming up because um, this time three years ago, we were actually building the canoe. Uh, three years ago, two years ago, it's all a blur. Two years ago, sorry. Cold and, the the time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the first part about building the canoe was that um, my biggest my biggest concern as as the organizer for the project was that I had to be able to be part of a canoe build before leading it. And so that meant that, um, you know, I was part of a canoe build prior to our canoe build in 2019 that um, that I went out harvesting. Like, whoever thought that I could, you know, as as part of my job that I could go into the bush and go harvest um, birch bark, or that I could go harvest uh, spruce roots. I could go harvest cedar, uh, cedar trees specifically. And so that's uh, that's a, the first part, the first step in building a wigwashima on a birch bark canoe is harvesting the materials, which may not sound like a lot, but harvesting materials actually takes more time than the canoe build itself uh, because of the, the time of year, the season, um, and the geographic location in which materials need to be harvested. So yeah, it, it's a really big answer, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess just in case, uh, I know they were talking about the hardest element of it too, so it would be the harvesting element is, is getting out and that's the most challenging bit. This Yes, that was most definitely the hardest part. Like, um, if you could just imagine like being in a swamp in June or July when the bugs are out. So sometimes mosquitoes, depending where we are, or black flies, like a, a lot of work. <laughs> How are you sourcing it? Like, is it specific trees that you're looking for? Is it a certain age? Is it something that you can see when you're looking at? Like, and how do you gain that knowledge? This is the thing that always astonishes me when it comes to things like this. You know, these, these traditions have been passed on in many cases for thousands and thousands of years. Like, how do you know where to begin? How does it, like, I don't know. What, what did you do? <laughs> so actually, I'm really glad you asked that question because this is probably my favorite part about telling Oshkini Gig's story is that, uh, so she is made out of one single piece of birch bark. Uh, we added in a couple other pieces just for the aesthetics, but primarily it's one single sheet of birch bark. So if you can imagine pulling a or having a sheet of birch bark that is 16 feet long, that is about five feet wide, um, 
awesome. However, harvesting it is very tricky. <laughs> that um, I like to say that Nishnabig are the original tree huggers, and I'll tell you why. So I'm closer to being six foot tall than I am to being five. And so for me, I know that if I see a white birch tree and I can go and hug it and my fingers, if my fingers can touch or if they don't touch, that means that the circumference of the tree it, when unfolded into a sheet of bark is almost six feet. And so that's how I know that it's gonna be the right width um, to be able to be used for a birch bark canoe. But um, finding the width and, and the height together is really difficult. And that, uh, can you imagine finding a straight standing tree without any knots, without any notches, without any branches or imperfections for 16 feet consecutively? It's a lot of work. <laughs> I would say so. I love the tree huggers line, that's fantastic. Um, I know we're going to get a bunch of questions on canoes today, and so I, again, I want to invite our groups on YouTube, if you want to type any questions, Mr. Marchione's class, if you guys want to get ready and unmute your mic in the background, great, we will come back to our London class in a minute, but I wanted to go back uh, to the beginning of the program with a powwow, so this is something that, like, when I was a kid, I heard about a powwow, but I'd really love you to explain what exactly that entails, why it's so important for our students that might have never heard of that before from across Canada. Yeah, me which uh, a powwow. I love powwows. Uh, for me, it's it's a celebration of community. It's a celebration of identity, and that uh, typically uh, powwows can be like maybe a day long. Sometimes there's two two days. Sometimes, depending on where you are, they could be three or four days. But really, it's a celebration. It's a uh, it's a, a part of a ceremony of. Um, gratitude essentially in that you are practicing your gratitude for the land you're practicing your gratitude for your community and your family and, and those that you connect with and so typically it's uh it's it's dancing it's singing it's sharing food it's um a really really experiential um community event and uh it's happening all over the world um how it's happening now is a little different. Sometimes they're online um, or some people just uh, do them, uh, host their own little community powwow, however they may see fit. What a beautiful beautiful description and you sound like you really want to get to one very soon and certainly <laughs> I do, it sounds like a great time. Uh, you, you mentioned too with a powwow that you said uh, if people haven't been to one that they should really take that opportunity. Is anyone welcome to go to a power? Do you need an invite? Like for classes that might want to have this opportunity in the future, this is something we've heard from a lot of classrooms in the past. Uh, how do you go about doing that? I would say if there's one happening in in an area, perhaps maybe in your area or an area that you're comfortable with, um, go and visit. Chances are, if it's a public powwow, you're more than welcome to join. Uh, but I do understand with uh, different restrictions and different locations specifically that many First Nations um, have their own protocols with regards to the pandemic, that uh, those, those powwows may be closed just for community members only. Uh, but I do highly recommend um, even going on YouTube and looking at some other uh, powwows in the past that have happened and just um, taking a chance, taking a few minutes to, to perhaps listen and watch. Fantastic. I, the pandemic note was very important. 2022 powwows, baby. Uh, for a lot of people. Uh, we're getting there, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, let's head back to our environmental leaders. If you guys have another question, come on up and uh, take us away, guys. Okay. Hello, I'm Desi, and I was just wondering What's like your favorite or most memorable moment during the program? Ooh, no, no pressure, Kyla. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I definitely ha like going back to talking about about Oshkani Gig, talking about our birch bark canoe, was that uh, we were able to do a four day canoe trip this last August, uh, where myself uh, and my coworker we had paddled our birch bark canoe for four days. Uh, that was quite the experience. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. It was so challenging and it was so rewarding. Like if you've had a, had the opportunity to to paddle a canoe or a kayak, um, it's quite. Uh, I well, I personally enjoy it, and uh, paddling a birch bark canoe on Georgian Bay in in the territory of Nishnabeg people, which is 
who I come from, how I identify is quite um, profound. And often my coworkers and, and other youth who were along, um, who joined us along the, the canoe trip would just keep saying everything was mind-blowing to think about how our ancestors used to paddle their own birch bark canoes along the shores of Georgian Bay just as we did um, but to think that it wasn't too long ago within the last three four five generations uh, that our families were paddling their their wigwashimon on their birch bark canoes along Georgian Bay. What a special experience. I really, I said at the top too, if people haven't had the chance to be in a canoe out in the water in Georgia Bay or anywhere in Ontario, uh, I was in Algonquin Park a few weeks ago for fall colors and it's really one of the most extraordinary things you can experience on the planet is to be out uh, in the middle of a lake doing something like that. You you also, you did something in the, the Ontario Parks video that I thought was fantastic. You called it the technology, which is something uh, the Ontario Science Centre I've seen talking about Indigenous innovations in, in Canada or Turtle Island, however people want to go about describing it. Uh, and it's so interesting to think that we as a, as a, as a landmass are so linked to this one innovation of the canoe, of getting around in the water. I mean, our highways were rivers, our places where people, communities were built, were on the edges of lakes. I mean, it's such a special story uh, with the canoe. What a cool experience for you guys. And so with the guided tours, I mean, again, pandemic aside, 2022 beyond, um, is the goal to have people coming up regularly where your amazing youth are taking them out and, and sort of telling the story in person out on the water? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm glad you asked that because this is kind of a, a funny conversation that I have with people is that um, we actually take Oshkina gig places where I have a roof rack on my car and we strap her to the top of my car and we've taken her, um, where have we taken her? We've taken her uh, into like the Aurelia area, which is pretty far for us. Like we haven't done that before, um, but we do have plans and we do have the capacity and opportunity to bring Oshkina gig to various places throughout Ontario. Um, traveling with a birch bark canoe is so much fun, uh, but having that opportunity to actually see Oshkina gig in person is unreal. There is no experience quite like it. So if we can't come to see you, uh, I highly recommend checking out visiting the Oshkina gig exhibits at Kilbert Provincial Park. Yeah, how neat is that? Um, you keep mentioning it's a she. So I know classically ships are she's in general. Is there a is there a initiative reason for this, or is it just something that's a, a personal decision? I'm curious. I'm glad you also asked that because we just have had this conversation over these last few months about Oshkina Gig. So when uh, we finished the canoe build and we were getting ready to launch, we had a naming ceremony. So as Anishinaabeg, uh, this is quite a sort of almost like a rite of passage to receive your Anishinaabe name. And because the story of Oshkinigig came through community, that it was uh, an elder and other community members who really wanted this to happen, um, we decided that it was most appropriate and respectful to honor uh, their their steps and how they began this process for us by naming Oshkina Gig. And so we had asked a local elder uh, knowledge keeper that we all consider to be sort of like an uncle. And uh, he named Oshkina Gig and her name uh, talks about uh, youth and um, the new ones really. And so with that, we also uh, had this conversation and this uh, understanding that Oshkina Gig is gender fluid and that uh, you can use which pronouns are most comfortable for you. And so for me, I use she, her, uh, others will use they, them. And it, it just really depends on the person, uh, which also really reinforces the importance of how Oshkina Gig truly is uh, a vessel, uh, literally to paddle, but also a vessel of learning. Morning. Kyla, every time I ask you a question, you have the most beautiful and heartfelt answers. I love this program. <laughs> um, we have time flies and you're having fun, so I want to make sure we get in a few more questions before we wrap up. I knew you were going to get this question, so our environmental leaders, Mr. Pleasure, do you want to ask what you typed in the chat so we can get it for anyone who's watching? What's your query for Kyla? I have the same one. <laughs> Come on, take your time. Don't hurry. Oh, 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 sorry, I was far away. <laughs> All right, we want to know if you can come to London, Ontario with you, with uh, your awesome vessel. We would love to see your vessel. Further than the Rilia, Kyla, but my <laughs> word, you're the best school in the world here. Yes, oh my gosh, that would be so awesome. We would love to bring Oshkina Gig to London. Uh, that would be quite the adventure for us. Yeah. 
<laughs> we'll see if we can make it happen down the road. The thing with this Ingenious Plus series is that, like in our first program too, the classes all end up wanting to talk with our speaker afterwards. So if you guys want to connect, I will make that happen. That would be a really fun time. Um, let's take a few quick ones from YouTube before we wrap up. Uh, you highlighted in the powwow the you know the pride flag and how important that was. So in general, with this Ingenious Plus series, we're talking about innovation and you know. You, you've embodied this so well, this inclusive approach. Is there a way to make innovation more broadly inclusive? And is there a way that you're working on it with your group to make sure that everyone feels really, really welcome there? Good question. <laughs> um, for us, when we think about the work that we do is that uh, we're always learning and we make it try to make it as clear as possible to those that we work with participants or volunteers community partners that we're always learning and that if you have any sort of feedback for us on how to perhaps shift um or adapt our programming like please tell us like we want to know we want to figure out how we can support you we want to figure out how we can support others uh, another really good example is that um, due to the pandemic it was really hard to connect with young people uh, living in a rural area right in that uh, access to safe and reliable technology but also connectivity so having uh, safe and reliable internet isn't always um, an option. It's it's quite honestly, it is a privilege that a lot of individuals in uh, rural communities in northern Ontario um, don't have access to. And so for us, it meant okay. So let's let's try to figure out uh, the priorities of the young people we work with. Let's try to figure out how can we meet them where they're at, uh, because having them to continue their participation and involvement in our programming is so important that uh, we have to figure out how to be inclusive and accessible and understanding the systemic barriers to participation. And so um, that's kind of a long answer, but uh, answer. Yeah, we're always learning. <laughs> uh, let's take one more question. Mr. and Pleasures class, you guys can ask all day and I know you want to. Uh, come on back in, share that last one and then we'll wrap up from there. Thanks guys. All right, so one of the questions we had was more of a, a technical question. How do you put the pattern on the side of the boat? Because there's quite a lovely floral, I think it's like flowers or trees or something on the side there. Yes, oh, I love that the question came up. So I had said that Ocean and Gig is made out of one, uh, one sheet of birch bark. However, for the aesthetics, we included different types. So uh, the etching that you're referring to, the floral pattern and design along the sides is a winter bark. So winter bark um, is harvested in the winter because the uh, the birch tree, the growth rings, uh, haven't quite fully formed and attached to the bark itself. So when you harvest the bark, there's this thin layer of new growth that isn't fully formed. And so we're able to take um, sort of like an etching tool, maybe like scissors, um, like a little, I forget what it's called, like a little scalpel thing. And uh, we etch a design into the winter bark. And winter bark etching is a very, very old uh Gete Nishnabeg, a really old Nishnabe piece of knowledge, documentation, and transmission. Uh, Nishna big stories have been told on winter bark scrolls uh, that have been found and that are stored in museums throughout Turtle Island. Um, so I'm really glad that question came up because winter bark is super, super intricate, super delicate, uh, very hard to harvest, but also a very fundamental piece to uh, history of, of this place that we call Canada. Beautiful question, guys. And what I think we should do next time we do a program, Kyla, is get the Perry Sound Starbucks to fund this whole thing because they have the <laughs> ultimate shout out in this. Uh, what an unusual place or such an amazing thing to come from. But uh, Kyla, thank you so much for sharing your story today. This was really beautiful. I really hope people get the chance to, to you know, head and, and visit you guys in person uh, in the months to come to learn so much more. Uh, I certainly had a fantastic time. I know our environmental leaders did as well. Uh, and so I really appreciate you joining us today. <laughs> Me good. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Jill, I'll bring you back in as well, and I'll highlight for our folks at home, if you guys want to check out the Ingenious Plus program, go to ingeniousplus.ca. So many opportunities to innovate yourselves and learn more from our incredible speakers we've got going on all week long. Exploringbytheseat.com slash ingenious. Kyla might be the best, but we've got a bunch of other great programs. Keep coming back. Seven more programs to come. I promise it's going to be fun. Um, and I want to bring in our environmental leaders. Just a huge thank you and farewell, everybody.